This week on Jerusalem Dateline, a trip to the front lines of Israel's battle with Hamas. What do Israeli soldiers face? Plus, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu makes an unusual offer to Iran. And the Bomb of Gilead, an ancient biblical plant revived. And digging the Bible in Israel's first capital, Shiloh. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. The Palestinians' UN permanent representative asked for a vote condemning Israel for what he calls excessive use of force against Palestinians trying to breach the Gaza border into Israel. It's the latest attempt of many attempts to pit the world against Israel as it defends itself. We went to the border and found those protests presented a challenge most countries have never faced. CBN News got a rare up-close look at the violence on the border of Hamas-controlled Gaza. We're standing just a few yards away from the Israel-Gaza border. This is the front lines of a more than two-month battle between Hamas and the Israeli Defense Forces. Like many other places along the border, soldiers face deadly force. Today we've had three grenades thrown at Israeli troops at this specific location. It's not legitimate and civilian riot. The leaders of the riot is Hamas and they are trying to challenge us. This frontline commander said the IDF faces daunting military challenges defending its border. If you take civilians and you put between them people to throw grenades and you put between them women and children, then you make us challenge all the time. But we have the rules of engagement. Those rules include dropping leaflets the day before an expected demonstration warning Gazans to stay away from the fence. The next day they use loudspeakers to keep people away. Then they shoot tear gas for those who approach the fence. And after that, only shooting in the air. Or if they will try to cross the fence with using of cutters, using of burning tires, there will be no choice and they will have to shoot with snipers to the foot. And that's what we do before we use little weapon. He says their priority is protecting Israelis. Nobody wants to cross Israel to hug uh, the people that live in Nachalos or in Nativa Asara. That's not their purpose. A few hundred meters behind us is the kibbutz of Nachal Oz. For the soldiers who are deployed here, it's very clear. We're here to defend against a massive amount of violent rioters who are hiding terrorists behind them. They want to tear down the defenses and get inside. And our job as a military of a sovereign nation is to stop them and to defend our Israeli civilians. Throughout the demonstrations, the IDF faced criticism at the UN, world capitals and the media to the critics, I'd say, stand in our shoes and walk in our boots a few miles, have those thousands of rioters and terrorists try to invade into your country and to risk or to threaten your civilians and then uh, criticize us. Thousands of miles away from the Gaza border, on June 12th, the World Watch, one of the most important summits in years. U.S. President Donald Trump met with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un with the goal of ridding the Korean Peninsula of nuclear weapons. The outcome of that summit will have a direct impact here in the Middle East, especially in regards to the possibility of a nuclear Iran. After the summit, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said U.S. foreign policy is being felt in this region. He said President Trump has also taken a strong stand against Iran's efforts to arm itself with nuclear weapons and against its aggression in the Middle East. This is already affecting the Iranian economy. President Trump's policy is an important development for Israel, the region, and the entire world. Netanyahu also referred to another development in Iran, its worst drought in 50 years. And that means millions of Iranians face water shortages unless something changes. And Netanyahu says Israel stands ready to help. It's an annual ritual since Ayatollah Khomeini took control in 1979. On Arad's Quds, or Jerusalem Day, thousands march shouting death to Israel while burning U.S. and Israeli flags and parading effigies of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It's just more evidence of Iran's goal to destroy Israel. In the midst of all that hate, Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke directly to the Iranian people. Today I'm going to make an unprecedented offer to Iran. 
It relates to water. The Iranian people are victims of a cruel and tyrannical regime that denies them vital water. Israel stands with the people of Iran, and that is why I want to help save countless Iranian lives. Here's how. Iran's meteorological organization says that nearly 96% of Iran suffers from some levels of drought. Issa Kalantari, a former Iranian agriculture minister, said that 50 million Iranians could be forced out of their homes due to environmental damage. 50 million. Netanyahu pointed out Israel also faces water challenges and has developed cutting-edge technologies to solve those challenges. Israel recycles nearly 90% of its wastewater. That's far more than any other country on Earth. We invented drip irrigation. Our technology targets individual plants with exactly the nutrients they need for each plant. Israel has the know-how to prevent environmental catastrophe in Iran. I want to share this information with the people of Iran. Sadly, Iran bans Israelis from visiting, so we'll have to get creative. To reach the Iranian people, Israel launched a website in Iran's own language, providing detailed plans on how Iranians can recycle wastewater, save crops, and feed their families. While Iran's leaders rejected Netanyahu's appeal, others see it as a significant gesture from one people to another. I think it was a very important statement coming from the Israeli prime minister to the people of Iran that we are not just ready to renew our friendship between the nations, we are ready to help them in anything they would find useful, that Israel would help them, like water resolves. The Iranian regime shouts, death to Israel. In response, Israel shouts, life to the Iranian people. Coming up, digging the Bible in one of the most important places in ancient Israel, its first capital, Shiloh. Recently, we visited one of the most important places in ancient Israel, its first capital, Shiloh. There we found archaeologists along with dozens of volunteers digging back into its history this summer. And here's my interview with lead archaeologist Scott Stripling. Well, Scott, it's a real blessing to be here in Shiloh, or some people call it Shiloh. Right. Can you describe what's going on here right now? Well, first of all, welcome to ancient Shiloh. This is uh, the first capital of, uh, of ancient Israel. Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim, and we're in the center of Eph Ephraimic territory right here. And it's a sacred spot because the Mishkan was here, the tabernacle where people came to connect with God. Can you describe the site at all? You have students here, you have professors, you have uh, a lot of activity going on. What's happening? What we're doing is exposing this massive fortification wall to my right and your left which encircles the entire site. It was built in the Canaanite period, but it was taken over by the Israelites and served as a, as a boundary for the sacred precinct. We have students from 11 different universities participating in our consortium, which is called the Associates for Biblical Research. So under that umbrella, regular volunteers from wherever and students from universities, some of them getting college credit for, for doing this, can come and actually dig the Bible and, and reveal these things that have not been seen in thousands of years. What is digging the Bible and why is it even so special to you? Well, you know, you, you can read the Bible, you can walk the Bible, but the ultimate is to dig the Bible. You know, when we actually get into the soil, like these students from Lee University, mm -hmm. they're, they're literally, it's under their fingernails and in their nose and their mouth and their ears, and they're exposing this ancient culture, it becomes one with you. And sort of like we came out of the soil, and as we dig into this soil, we connect with God and with each other, I think, in a very important way. And what scriptures mean a lot to you when you think about digging? Well, Psalm 102, 14 is one of my favorite verses. It says, O Zion, blessed are those who love your dust and cherish your stones. And, and do you see what's happened archaeologically? Is it verifying the biblical record? Oh, absolutely. We can see a clear transition, Chris, from when we go from the Amorites who first built the site into the Israelite period. For example, the bones change from 4% pig bone to 1% pig bone once we go into the Israelite period. The pottery changes and we get the classic what we call collared rim pottery. And so all these classic indicators that there's been a, an ethnic change that has taken place. What can archaeology tell the skeptics that may uh, question the Bible? 
archaeology doesn't set out to prove or disprove the Bible. What we want to do is to illuminate the biblical text, the background of the text. So to set it in a real world culture to what we call verisimilitude. So we, we get an ancient literary description. Now we have a material culture that matches that. Chris, you're sitting where Samuel and, and Eli and Hannah and these, these people that we have read about, they came just like us, needing answers, needing to connect with God, needing forgiveness. What are the lessons that you would like to get people to uh, understand that really can't come here personally, but what are the lessons that people uh, in the world need to know? Well, I think the, the biggest lesson is that we're dealing with real people, real places, real events. This is not mythology. The coins that we excavated today, we're talking about coins of Herod the Great, Pontius Pilate, Festus, Felix, Agrippa I, Agrippa II. The Bible talks about these people. We, we just, we've got the image right there. And ultimately, Chris, if the Bible is true, then the God of the Bible has a moral claim on our lives. And as we establish the veracity of the biblical text, I hope that everyone watching will just think about that, that God loves us and he has a moral claim on our lives. What have you discovered archeologically? Well, right out of the ground, we uh, just have a piece of a, what we call a measuring cup. It's a stone vessel, a chalk vessel from the first century. About 100 BC, there was a wave of ritual purity that swept through late second temple period Judaism, where they began to have daily immersion in the mikvah, uh, ossuary burial, and using stone vessels. Now this one was from yesterday, it's been washed already. So you see the same mm -hmm. form right out of the ground and yesterday. And these are those handles from the stone vessels. Remember Jesus' first miracle at Cana, they were stone jars full of water. That's that ritual purity culture of the first century. Um, here's the bone bag from this particular locus. So each one of these bones will be analyzed by our zoo archaeologist. The, the anthropologist does our human bones, the zoo archaeologist, the animal bones. So we know each single bone, the animal that it came from, so we understand their diet. We, we do flotation so we get seeds and so we know what they were eating, what their daily life was like. And of course a big part of what we do is pottery. So uh, we can see this is just from one locus here this morning, a tremendous amount of pottery. And we date it using these diagnostic pieces. So this is from the Roman period, New Testament mm -hmm. period. As they're going down, they're gonna get all the way through the Iron Age, the period of the tabernacle, and then all the way down into the Amorite period, which preceded it. So we wanna see that transition between those periods with clear, clear stratigraphy. So the, by the pottery, you can see exactly uh, you can find the, the particular age it was. That's right. The rims evert or they invert. The inclusions, like turn mm -hmm. that one over, you can see the size of the grit in yep. here. That's indicative of a certain time period mm -hmm. as well. The type of wear, the wheel markings are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Just like your great grandmother's pottery is different from your pottery that you're using today. Yeah. Yeah. And once we learn the pottery, then we can use it as our primary means of dating. And for me, that's good stuff. And I think your viewers will think it is too. Up next, one farmer revives Israel's ancient plant, the bomb of Gilead, when we come back. The Bible speaks about the bomb of Gilead. It was a real plant in the ancient Holy Land, used in medicine, cosmetics, and even for worship in the Jewish temple. Now a modern-day Israeli farmer is reviving that biblical agriculture along with frankincense and myrrh. But as Julie Stahl reports, he's also getting some resistance. Meet Guy Ehrlich, visionary, farmer, and possible provider of plants needed for incense for a future third temple. We are at the Balm of Gilad farm. This is the nursery. The division was to to make agriculture of the Balm of Gilad and, to, and then to make an industry out of it. Ehrlich is still in the early stages, but already he's helping turn the desert green on a tract of land near the Dead Sea and Jericho. Along the years I built a collection of rare uh, biblical and medical, medical and uh, perfume plants and I understood that there, there are some more uh, very interesting plants in my uh, collection that have a huge potential uh, uh, to benefit humanity. It started with the balsamone tree, better known as the Balm of Gilead. For a thousand years, ancient Hebrew farmers at the Dead Sea were the only ones in the world known to cultivate this exotic plant, using it for medicinal and cosmetic purposes. 
Now Ehrlich's biotech venture is reviving that trade and more. He knew how to make uh, out of it uh, one of the most important medication of the ancient world, a perfume that was considered to be the best perfume in the Roman Empire. Uh, it, it, it serves as the fifth uh, ingredient of the incense of the Holy Temple. And uh, uh, since the second temple period, it, it, it serves as the anointing oil of the kings of Israel. Uh, at the sixth century, it uh, disappeared from here together with the Jewish people. Ehrlich got his first plant from a shoot that was smuggled by a German scientist out of Saudi Arabia and brought to Israel. Oddly enough, the plants he grows are thriving in the intense heat and salty soil on the shores of the Dead Sea. I believe that in the future it would become a medicine. Before it would be a medicine, it will be a nutraceutical and a cosmetic. Before or after it, it, it might serve as the first ingredient of the incense of the temple. Ehrlich has six acres of Balm of Gilead trees so far and another 5,000 plants ready to be planted. Right now I'm the only and the biggest uh, Balm of Gilead farmer in the world. The resin from the bark, the berries and the leaves of the Balm of Gilead can all be used and each has a different fragrance and properties. Ehrlich also grows frankincense on his plantation. This is my second baby after the Balm of Gilad. I started with the vision of bringing back the Balm of Gilad to the shores of the Dead Sea. But after a few years, I understood that I have some other very interesting plants in my collection. And nowadays, I have a team of plants uh, that I want to make into products. There are more than 20 varieties of frankincense, but this is the one from the Bible. And it's considered an endangered species. This is the frankincense of the Holy Temple. Now. There is no agriculture for this tree. This tree only go wild in different countries at the own of Africa. And since there is such a big demand for this, there is overusing of the plant. Ehrlich is also growing myrrh, and there may be a connection to the gifts the Magi brought Jesus at his birth. Another way to uh, introduce myself is as a Magi. Uh, we know the three Magi, they brought uh, Miriam uh, presents. They gave her uh, frankincense and myrrh and gold. Now there is a claim that the gold is the balm of Gilad because it was more precious than gold. This is the diamond of the incense. This is the diamond of the medical plants. Ehrlich, who describes himself as a man of faith, but not religious, is also growing a number of other plants needed to make the incense for the temple. That has caught the attention of some religious Jews who would like to see a third temple built in Jerusalem. I definitely didn't thought that I'm going to serve the temple and I was surprised from the amount of uh, temple fans that came to visit me. And when uh, Rabbi Ariel was here, I told him uh, that I'll be more than happy to supply the incense uh, for the temple and I'll do my best uh, to be ready with the incense uh, till the temple would be here. But I told him that I'm not going to build him a temple. But despite his excitement over his team of plants, Ehrlich has also had some big challenges. His plantation is in Biblical Judea, known to the world as the West Bank, and that has scared off an American company who partnered with Ehrlich for years. One reason? Backlash from BDS, the anti-Israel boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. I'm sorry for this company that uh, they surrendered for this wicked movement, but uh, what can I do about it? I can only uh, fight it by uh, succeeding without them. He's had to dismiss his Israeli and Palestinian workers and rely on volunteers like Kinneret and her friends, who spent a week here, among other things, pulling weeds. If this is what we can do to help, this is what we can do to make uh, the, the world better at the end, so this is our job. The setback isn't stopping Ehrlich. His goal is to start a research and development center for medical plants that he hopes will benefit the area and the region. And, as the Bible says, Make the desert bloom. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Balm of Gilead Farm at the Dead Sea. Coming up, helping a new immigrant family survive and thrive in their new homeland. Jewish people returning to Israel is prophecy fulfilled and for many a dream come true. But oftentimes the struggles of starting a new life in a new land can be overwhelming. And that's what happened to Alex and Diane. When they had no food and ran out of money, they didn't know what to do. And that's when CBN stepped in to help. Alex and Diane are a young Jewish couple who immigrated to Israel from Belarus. 
They told me it was their dream to come to the Promised Land to build a better life for their two children. I felt a calling for many years to make our home in Israel, and I believed that it would be the best place for our family. Belarus is very low income and there aren't many opportunities. I wanted my children to have the best chance at life and I knew Israel held that for them, but still we have struggled. Alex expected to find a job right away in Israel, but weeks passed and the family's savings dwindled. Soon they went into debt just buying food. It got to the point where we didn't have anything. We were in crisis. I felt like I failed my family, and it was horrible. It was very difficult for my husband because I knew he was doing everything he could to take care of us. We never owed money before, and we never had to ask for help. We had no idea what to do. Then Diane met someone who told her about CBN Israel. We started giving the family food and diapers. We also taught them how to manage their finances in Israel. We gave them some money to get them out of debt and even helped them find furniture for their apartment through a local ministry partner. We couldn't believe it that you would just give this support and expect nothing in return. You made sure my children had food to eat. Thanks to CBN Israel, the family got through that difficult transition. Now, Alex works full-time installing drywall and is supporting his family. It means so much to know that you wanted to help us. Thank you for this. You have given us a great start and now we have a bright future in Israel. The situation we were in had nearly squeezed the life out of us, but you gave us air to breathe again. Now we want to help others just as you have helped us. Thank you. Well, that's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.